talk for our evening worship. I was trying to be careful with the wording of the title of the lesson. Four of the biggest decisions you will ever make. I didn't say these are the biggest ones. I'm saying they're four of the biggest ones because they're somewhat arbitrary. I've chosen these and I've chosen them in what I'll call hindsight. And you know what they say about that. Hindsight is 2020, meaning that you learn from your own mistakes and experience and you can see things clearer when you look backward in history and you can see maybe how you should have done some things that you didn't do. And so this is hindsight 2020 kind of discussion this morning, and you'll likely add to my four big decisions that I'm going to share with you. I hope this will get you started in that direction. I'm going to share my list with you. I'm going to give you some biblical reasoning why I've chosen them, and if it helps you, if it causes you to think about the importance of a good Bible foundation as you frame your life, it will be time well spent this morning. We are going to begin with decision number one, and that is the company that we keep. And most of us are probably familiar with this next text. It's on the negative side of this issue, found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. In this particular text, in the chapter in which it is found, the Apostle Paul is confronting some who were teaching there's no bodily resurrection. It's like Rover. When you're dead, you're dead all over. There's no bodily resurrection. When the Lord comes back, that's the end of everything. Well, Paul's confronting that because it's in error. And he's using this ancient proverb from a pagan poet Bad company corrupts good morals. And there is a biblical ring of truth to that old proverb. And Paul's talking about that and he's warning with it. The whole chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, deals with the bodily resurrection. There is a spiritual resurrection when we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, we learn what the gospel is. It includes the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. We also learn in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7 that we are saved from our sins by the blood of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, it is the gospel which saves us. If the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ saves us, it must in some way contact the saving blood of Christ because it is the blood of Christ that saves us. In Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, we learn how we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are buried by baptism into the death of Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. So in baptism... Baptism into the death of Christ, a burial by baptism into the death of Christ, a resurrection from the waters of baptism, we must in some way at that moment contact the saving blood of Christ. You put all of those thoughts together, you have an understanding of the spiritual resurrection, raised from the deadness of our sins to new life in Christ to live as Christians. But there's also a bodily resurrection on the last day. And as you continue reading in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning about verse 12, it begins to talk all about that until you get to that last verse where we are told to continue steadfastly. We know that our labor is not in vain in the Lord, and we should not be swayed any other direction from that course. There's a bodily resurrection just as Jesus was raised from the tomb, so that tells about our bodily resurrection on the last day. And what Paul's pointing out in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33 is this. That those who distort Bible teaching are bad company. They will corrupt good morals. Those who distort what the Bible affirms are bad company to be avoided. 
And when Bible teaching is misunderstood, there are consequences in life practice. It will corrupt good morals. It will corrupt good habits of living. There's a connection between what we teach and how we live. It affects the mind, the emotion, and the choices that we make in life. If we choose to surround ourselves with the biblically illiterate or at least the biblically confused, we will be listening to voices that will derail our lives from the good outcome God has designed for us. Bad company corrupts good morals. On the positive side of that coin, we have this statement in Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. The wounds of a friend are good for us because a real friend will correct us when we're wrong. A good friend will disagree with us when we're in error. In Ephesians chapter 4 verses 14 and 15 we read this. As a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But, and here's a big part of that, here's a big part of the reason why we're not drawn away into false teaching. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. They will speak truth to us. They will help to keep us on the right path in life, on that path that leads home to heaven and pleases our God. Faithful are the wounds of a friend because they'll tell us the truth, whether it's what we want to hear or not. Ephesians 4.25, you just keep reading in that chapter. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. And in that way, we care about each other. So we're, we're going to lay aside falsehood. We're going to speak truth to each other. And in that way, we'll guard each other's souls as we move toward heaven and away from error. We don't necessarily say what somebody wants to hear, but we say what they need to hear so that they can go to heaven. We do so lovingly and kindly and as gently as possible. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 27, the Apostle Paul stated that he did not shrink from declaring the whole counsel of God to those at Ephesus in the church there. Paul was good company. When he met with those elders for the last time at Miletus, they hugged each other, they cried with each other, they loved one another, and they prayed with each other. That was good company because it told the whole counsel of God, didn't hold back anything that God's word would teach, and it helped guard each other toward eternal good. In Galatians 4 and verse 16, Paul was willing to be thought of as an enemy because he was willing to tell them the truth when their soul was in danger. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? He was willing to be thought of that way, but he was good company. He would help them to get to heaven, even when it was what they didn't want to hear. Good friendships founded on God's word will strengthen each other in godliness. Is that the kind of friendships that you have? It doesn't matter whether it's here or at school or at work or anything else that we do. Are those the kinds of friends that you have? Is that the company that you keep? Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12 and 13, if we make the figurative, the spiritual application will be on target here. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. When you're weak, when you're stumbling, when you're faltering, 
your friend, a Christian friend, will help hold you up and strengthen you so that you will not fall and be lost. One of the first big decisions we'll make in life is the kind of company that we keep. If you surround yourself with those who always agree with you and they tell you what you want to hear, you will lose the path of the narrow road. You need the kind of people around you who will help you and disagree with you when you need to be disagreed with. It's the failure of those in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 3 who always wanted their ears tickled, just itching to hear what I want to hear, and they went out searching for those who would tell them what they wanted to hear. If that's the kind of company you keep, that you choose, you'll lose the narrow way. Decision number two, major decision in life, is the person that we marry. And that is so very connected to the first decision, the kind of company that we keep. Because the company that we keep becomes our pool for finding and choosing a husband or a wife. And it's a lifelong decision. And it will season everything else that follows that wedding altar. Where you go, who you're with. Every activity you get involved in, how you spend your time, how you spend your money, your morals, your whole thinking process. And you will likely, in that marriage union, bring children into existence. And they'll have children, and they'll be your grandchildren, and you will bear responsibility and accountability for their souls to some degree. And even if you never have children, you at least bear responsibility for the one that you married to lead them to heaven. You'll influence the people, the people around you always. And if you choose in error the one that you're going to marry, you may lose your soul or at least find yourself in that prickly situation described in Matthew chapter 10 verses 34 through 39 where one now must choose between family member and loyalty to God. You don't want to put yourself in that position needlessly. It's hard enough when it comes. Here's a recommendation for further study. Whenever you open your Bible, whenever you begin to read and study the Bible, I always recommend pencil, paper, and prayer, the three P's of good Bible study. And so with your pencil and paper handy, as you begin to read your Bible today and every day, you'll have different pages that will have different lists on it, different things you discover in different books of the Bible. And one of those pages, you might think about devoting to the marriages you find in the Bible. And so you're making your notes and you're coming across, here's an unbeliever married to an, another unbeliever. How does that go in the Bible? What's that look like? Here is someone who is a believer and they're marrying an unbeliever. Here's one who is a believer and they're marrying another believer. What does that list look like? And as you discover that in the Bible from Old Testament to New, think about who you want to be, where you want to go, and what you want your home life to look like. And learn the lessons from the hindsight of the inspiration of Scripture. By the way, not everybody who wears the name Jesus is a Christian. So be careful about making shallow decisions based on a name. Learn more about them. This all begins in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. When the sons of God saw the daughters of men, and they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. They weren't caring about what was godly or ungodly. They just were going based on looks and attractiveness. And that ends up leading to the flood of Noah's day where the thoughts of the hearts of mankind was only evil continually. That's what that led to. Shallow decisions in who you marry. That's where that all begins. So make your negative list. All right, you're reading your Bible, you come across Ahab and Jezebel. 
You come across Ananias and Sapphira, Herod and Herodias, Nabal and Abigail. What do you learn from those negative situations? What about a positive list? Abraham and Sarah, Joseph and Mary, Zechariah and Elizabeth, Aquila and Priscilla. And you'll run across many others as you read your Bible. Have your pencil, your paper, and your prayer. And jot down that list and it will expand all the days of your life as you read your Bible. Remember the Old Testament warning as God's people, the children of Israel, were about to come into Canaan land. And in Deuteronomy chapter 7, about midway through verse 2, we begin reading this. You shall make no covenant with them and show no favor to them. Furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons. Why? What's the lesson? What's the principle? What do we learn? What should we be wise in today? For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he will quickly destroy you. The New Testament has similar instructions. Lest you think, oh, that's Old Testament and it doesn't have any application for us today. Well, it does. In the New Testament, we read this in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 14. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light and darkness? That warning would include our friendships. It would include any arrangement that would give the ungodly sway in our life. And it would include marriage. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 39. A wife is bound as long as her husband lives. But if her husband is dead, she is free to be married to whom she wishes. Only in the Lord. We put ourselves in a dangerous place when we have a man-made denominational view of what is in the Lord. Bible basics are a necessity for home and church. These are major decisions that we make in life and it will change life and it may well change eternity. Here's food for thought if you happen to get hungry later. Something I'd like you to think about. You may find yourself in love. Are you in love today? You may find yourself in love with a person who does not know or does not understand the gospel accurately. I always think of a humorous scene in the Disney show Bambi. And one day Bambi sees the animals acting really weird. And he asks, what's the matter with them? And Bambi is informed Nearly everybody gets Twitter painted in the springtime. And then it's further explained is that time when your knees get weak and your head is in a whirl. You're not thinking clearly anymore. Your heart's involved in it. And you're all mushy and weak inside. And that's all you can think about. You're Twitter painted. Are you in love with someone who doesn't know or understand the gospel accurately? Watch out, your head's in a whirl. You're not thinking clearly. You're thinking with your emotions more than with your Bible brain. Let me ask you something, and this is to jog your mind back into function. If you love them, do you love them? If you love them, what would be the priority of that relationship? Oh, I love them. Do you love them enough to want them to go to heaven? What should be the priority of the relationship? What should that be about? What should you be striving to do more than anything else in the whole wide world if you love them? And if they rejected Bible truth, would that be a deal breaker for you? And if your answer to that is 
no, that wouldn't be a deal breaker for me, then you've just learned something significant about yourself. And that's something to which you need to respond to God directly. Because there's nothing more important than God. And He's worthy of our worship. And He is the purpose of our life. And if we love people, we'll want them to go to heaven. And we will be very careful about the company that we choose and the person that we marry. And we'll have first things first. Decision number three, the career we choose. Paul, along with Aquila and Priscilla, was a tent maker, Acts 18, verses 1 through 3, and he used his trade to promote his opportunities in preaching. Some careers are conducive to godliness. Others struggle against godliness. Most jobs are rather neutral. It depends on how we use them and how we prioritize God in them. If you find yourself in a career choice that regularly forbids your church attendance, you need a new job. If it hinders your spiritual growth or compromises your Christian values, you need a new job. If it demands so much of you that you cannot be active in God's kingdom, you need a new job. Matthew 6, verse 33, But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. If you believe that verse to be true, you will put God first and believe that He can deliver a kind of job that will supply you the needs that you have in life. Genesis 13 and following on from there, Lot allowed his career to undermine his faith and his family. Levi, we know him better as Matthew, and Zacchaeus were tax collectors. That career was notorious for dishonesty. It was a career choice that had more pitfalls than promise. Career choices will take your life in a direction that either promotes or prevents God from having the right place in your life. Ephesians 4.28 is wise counsel from God. And that is that he who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor for performing with his own hands what is good. So that... He will have something to share with the one who has need. That is a wholesome, godly perspective of career and money. Others view career like the rich fool who built his bigger barns but was void of God in his life. Luke chapter 12. Decision number four. Our response when we first hear and understand the gospel Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. The gospel, and we started our morning this way in 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel is a about the Lord's suffering, His death, His burial, and His resurrection. There is a message that is preached in the Bible to tell you what that suffering of our Lord means. To tell you how to appropriate His saving blood to your own soul. How will His blood forgive your sin? There is a message that must accompany the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It is not enough to believe the gospel is true. It's not enough to know that Jesus is the Son of God. There is a message to define how His sacrifice will apply to your soul and wash away your sins. That message begins to be preached in Acts chapter 2 for the first time teaching us how that sacrifice will apply to us individually and wash away our sins. And as you continue reading through the book of Acts, everyone who obeyed that message did so immediately upon first hearing and understanding that message. 
And the culmination of that message is in the waters of baptism. There is a lot more that goes into that than the waters of baptism. But that's where it culminates. There is such a lack of precision in the denominational world about how one is saved by the blood of Christ. Most who think they're saved have never obeyed the gospel in the Bible taught way. It is imperative that one hears the right message in order to be saved. As Peter was on his way to Cornelius, we read this. He will speak words to you by which you will be saved. Acts 11, verse 14. There is a message by which one is saved. And any message that distorts that will not lead to a correct application of the gospel of Christ. And that matters. When they heard that right decision, they would respond. Throughout the book of Acts, believing the message to be true, confessing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, repenting of their sins that have separated them from God, and being baptized for the remission of their sins. When King Agrippa began to hear that message from the lips of the Apostle Paul, he dismissed it with a jesting remark, and we sing a song about that, almost persuaded. Almost, but lost. And then there were others, as in Acts chapter 7, verse 57, as Stephen was preaching that message, they stopped their ears. They physically put their hands over their ears so they couldn't hear the message. They wouldn't even listen to it. Now here's something important as we close our lesson this morning. If this last decision our response to the gospel of Christ. If this last decision is made first, the other three will naturally fall into line. The company we keep, the person we marry, the career we choose, and how we use it. So as we offer the invitation, you may be deciding right now, today, at this moment, how the rest of your life is going to go. Are you subject to the invitation of Christ? If so, please come forward while we stand and sing.